Welcome to this presentation. Here we will be looking at the ending of Mark chapter 16 and we'll be looking in particular at verses 9 through to 20 and trying to look at the question, are these original? Are they authentic? Do they belong to the Gospel of Mark? Did Mark write them? Or were they some later edition that was added on by some scribe to uh, patch up missing a missing ending to these verses. This of course is quite a controversial subject in much of a Christian world. Um, these verses include uh, references to miracles, to speaking in tongues, to healing and uh, so it's and it's saying those that believe will see these signs and the question then is um, if you don't see these signs, does that mean you're not a believer? That's how important it is uh, that these to establish whether or not these verses are correct. Are they uh, are they uh, divinely inspired? Are they genuinely part of the Gospel of Mark, or are they some fabrication that was introduced at a later date? Now. We'll just look at a few of these verses. We won't look at all of the uh, 12 verses, but we'll start in verse 15 and read them out. And he said unto them, that's Jesus, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall I cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with the signs following. Amen. So it's talking there about uh, a signs following gospel, a gospel where the Lord works with his uh, disciples and confirms the word with these signs, signs that are mentioned above. So it's obviously a very important to establish are these, ver are these verses genuine? Are these signs genuine? Are these uh, really real? Uh, or are these some kind of later edition? would say from the very beginning if this is some kind of later edition it's a very very odd thing to add at a later point in church history particularly since in a later point in church history those signs weren't around so so why why would it that be the case but we'll go through and look at all of the questions the ins and outs of these things first of all a little bit of background in proverbs 22 verse 12, the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge and he overthrows the words of a transgressor. So it's trying to indicate to us that the Lord, that the Lord preserves knowledge and perhaps it's indicating to us that the Lord would preserve his word, that would keep it safe through the ages, that it wouldn't let it get lost or forgotten and that if it's forgotten it's our fault, not the Lord's fault. Now just a bit of background, the spirit of early Christianity was throughout the, uh, uh, what was then the Roman Empire, the region around the Mediterranean Sea, the Middle East, uh, and even as far as uh, England, um, and Spain, and North Africa. So Christianity, Christianity spread to many countries, and uh, they had uh, various languages, in addition to the various languages that they spoke, the, there was uh, Greek as a kind of common language that was quite familiar to many people around much much of a region. That's not to say everybody would have spoken Greek, but uh, particularly those who were engaged in commerce or, or trade would have uh, been familiar with some kind of language so they could communicate with people from other countries and there really was a lot of trade between the different countries. 
one question that people sometimes ask is what language did Jesus speak? And the general consensus among the, the scholars, that doesn't necessarily mean it's correct, but the general consensus is that Jesus primarily spoke Aramaic. While Hebrew and Greek were also commonly used throughout the Middle East and beyond during that time. So it's quite reasonable to suppose that Jesus spoke Aramaic so everybody there could understand him. Uh, everybody in that region would have known Aramaic. That was their regional language. So it's quite possible that the Gospels themselves, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, may have originally been written in Aramaic and then later translated into Greek and then uh, uh, from the Greek, of course, it's translated into many other languages, including the modern languages that we have today. Of course, we don't really know for certain, but that's the supposition. Um, when we talk about an original Greek, perhaps it's <laughs> maybe that's not even a sensible thing to say if it was originally written in Aramaic, but uh, maybe we're talking about the first translation or the or the first narrative in the, in the Greek language. The epistles of Paul were written in Greek from the very start. They were obviously sent to uh, Greek-speaking cities, uh, especially ones like Corinth and uh, uh, Thessalonica and uh, and other of the cities like Philippi, Colossae, uh, and uh, and Ephesus. So we tend to get the picture of the of the uh, early um, Bible or, or books of the Bible where that we see them as being in Greek, and we'll just uh, adopt that from the from the current uh, uh, from this point onwards. Even though we have a caveat that maybe uh, some of them were originally written in Aramaic. Now, when you're talking about manuscripts of the New Testament, um, the New Testament has been preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient work of literature, with over 5,000 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts cat catalogued, some of them incredibly old, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, 9,000 manuscripts in various other languages, including uh, Syriac, Slavic, Gothic, Ethiopic, Coptic, and Armenian. So there really is a lot of information about the, the New Testament. And uh, obviously so there would be very old manuscripts and newer manuscripts. Uh, of the, over time, um, manuscripts degrade, fall apart, and uh, become unreadable. People have to make copies of copies, and then copies of copies of copies. Sometimes you can get copying errors creeping in and uh, that's an in inevitable consequence. And once one copy error creeps in, later copies of those copies can maintain that uh, uh, that uh, that original mistake. So, so you can trace back and see um, and try and make guesses at, at uh, early, what the early manuscripts would have looked like even when you don't have many copies of the earliest manuscripts. Um, the, the experts have tried to group the, uh, the manuscripts into different uh, types, uh, depending on the, the small differences that are involved. Now, obviously, when you copy a manuscript, there can be quite a few different types of errors. If you've just got one manuscript and you're copying from that to another one, then you, it's quite conceivable that uh, you start to have omissions, that you forget things. If you've got multiple manuscripts to look at and you're acting like a bit of an editor and you're taking several old ones and trying to create a new one, then you might sort of combine the the the, uh, the ones that you have into a new one. So for the later manuscripts, you expect to see more additions. For the early ones, you expect to see more omissions. 
Um, it, yeah, I should emphasize that we're talking about really tiny differences uh, and uh, uh, on the mo for the most part these differences don't uh, affect doctrine to uh, any significant extent. So there are, there are three or maybe four text types of omitted uh, Caesarean text type uh, or Caesarean text type which is uh, less common but text types that, that are definitely present and uh, definitely have been studied uh, starting with the Alexandrian text type sometimes called the neutral text type Obviously, the person who called it a, a neutral text type was, was not themselves very neutral to give it that kind of name. But the earliest manuscripts of this type date from the 2nd to the 4th centuries and appear to come from around Alexandria in Egypt and from the Alexandrian church. It contains readings that are often terse, shorter, somewhat rough, less harmonized, and generally, generally more difficult, and we could go into more detail on, on that on another point. But for let's just say for the moment that, that in most cases they're, they're shorter readings, sometimes a little bit awkward readings, but some of the uh, manuscripts are actually very, very old. There is another text type known as the Western text type, and uh, examples include manuscripts in the 3rd th to the 9th century and they come from a wide geographical region stretching from North Africa to Italy and from Gaul to Syria. It includes, it occurs in Greek manuscripts and in the Latin translations used by the Western Church, obviously taking those Greek manuscripts and translating them into Latin. It is seen to be more prone to paraphrase and other corruptions so it's generally regarded as maybe not the most reliable of, uh, of text types. Then we come to the Byzantine text type. I think maybe it was called Byzantine as a kind of derogatory term by the person who coined the phrase uh, because Byzantine had sort of negative connotations of being uh, unnecessary, complex and convoluted and uh, devious. But uh, that's by the by. Uh, the name is, is stuck. It's also known as the majority text because it comprises uh, a group, uh, almost 95% of all the manuscripts. So it really is the vast majority of manuscripts. Examples include manuscripts from the 5th to the 16th centuries. It became uh, dominant at Constantinople from the 5th century on and was used throughout the Eastern Orthodox Church in the Byzantine Empire. It underlines, underlies the Textus Receptus or the Received Text uh, used for most Reformation era translation of the New Testament. So that includes, for instance, uh, the uh, the King James version of the Bible, based on on Greek uh, English translation of of this Greek text type. So now we come eventually come back to Mark chapter sixteen, and people have said there are four endings, or well, I'd say there are three endings and one missing it and one absence of an ending but uh, we'll say for, in f for the sake of argument that there are four endings. The first one is an ending that stops abruptly at verse 8 in Mark chapter 16. Now stopping at verse 8, um, we'll, we'll read the verse in a moment, but verse 8 ends with and the women were afraid which is a very odd place to end the gospel uh, you compare it with the other Gospels, nothing like that. You uh, want to end a Gospel with some kind of inspirational message, not the women were afraid. Um, 
and that's not in any way to put down the women who are involved in that. Uh, just to say that uh, this is not uh, a credible ending or a genuine ending. So it gives the impression that there's something missing, that there's something lost. Now, obviously, if there's something missing, um, people have been unhappy with the prospect of just stopping abruptly at uh, verse 8. So uh, the second type of ending, people have added a brief passage uh, after verse 8. Now they're not saying this is original, this is just a kind of tidy up conclusion to the gospel that they've added in the absence of a genuine ending. And nobody believes that's an authentic ending to uh, Ma uh, Mark chapter 8, or at least not original. Now then we get the third case of a complete verses that you might see, for example, at the King James translation of the Bible, verses 9 through to 20. And you do see in other translations as well, but sometimes with a dreaded footnote casting aspersions on the reliability of those verses. And then the fourth case is only seen in one particular manuscript. It's a rather odd uh, passage, but it's an insertion um, uh, in the midst of these verses 9 through to 20. It adds a little bit extra, <laughs> very peculiar uh, extra bit, almost certainly a uh, Western text type corruption of some kind. So this long, long ending in Codex Washingtonianus uh, after Mark 16 verse 14 there's an insertion and they asked and said this generation of lawlessness and of faithlessness is under Satan who doth not allow the truth of God to prevail over the unclean things of the spirits therefore make manifest thy righteousness Spo so spoke they now to Christ and Christ said unto them the tale of the years of the domination of Satan is fulfilled, but other terrible things draw near, and by reason of the sins of him I was delivered over unto death, that they may return to the truth and, s and sin no more, that they may inherit the spiritual and incorruptible glory of the righteousness which is in heaven. So this really is a rather odd insertion. Um, I don't think anyone believes that this is a genuinely original uh, um, piece of scripture. Um, the most likely explanation for its insertion is some uh, some copyist, some uh, monk, uh, maybe uh, under the influence of something, just making a, some random addition. Who knows what really happened? There is the there is a faint possibility that maybe in the first century when the, when the Gospel of Mark was being distribute, distributed that there was someone there who was present in those days and they said, aha, I also remember that such and such was said and that was how this that got added into one copy of the manuscript but that's pure idle speculation. It's probably the only way you would uh, envisage how uh, how this extra bit gets added in when none of the other copies of the manuscripts have it. But for the moment, it's safest to assume it's uh, not uh, not scripture, not uh, not divinely inspired. Now, the case of Mark chapter sixteen and stopping at verse eight. Uh, Mark 8 reads, And they, referring to the women, they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. So, not only does this end with uh, the women being afraid, it, uh, it ends with the, with the empty tomb, and them not saying anything to anybody, and that's apparently 
uh, the end of a gospel? Not likely. It's it's incredibly unlikely that that's the genuine end of a gospel of Mark as written by Mark or whoever he dictated it to. So we we all can say with all, almost complete certainty that this that there were that this is not the end. That there are, that there are more verses after this. So the manuscripts that don't have these verses, well, when did they go missing? I guess that's the question. Now the response to, uh, to the missing ending is an addition. Now in some manuscripts they added a little bit extra, perhaps to tidy things up neatly to have a to write a bit of conclusion to the gospel so that it's not left hanging there. And so they add the phrase and they reported all, all the instructions briefly to Peter and his companions. Afterward through them Jesus sent forth from east to west the sacred and perpetual proclamation of eternal salvation. And this shorter ending first appears in the seventh century. So it's quite late in the piece and there are not that many copies of that I believe. Um, according to Bruce uh, Met Metzger and he wrote, wrote a very famous and uh, authoritative commentary on the Greek New Testament. He writes the internal evidence for the shorter ending is decidedly against its being genuine besides containing a high percentage of non marken that means not typical Mark type speech uh, words, its, its re rhetorical tone differs totally from the simple style of Mark's gospel. So that shorter ending is not genuine. The, the case of stopping at verse 8, that's a defi deficient ending and then there was the, the bizarre ending which we, which we won't even mention anymore. So many modern translations include verses 9 to 20, but they add footnotes to suggest they are not reliable. And my copy of NIV has a footnote saying the two most reliable early manuscripts do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20, which is technically correct but highly misleading. Um, it gives the impression that it's more reliable to exclude those verses, to ignore them. Um, it's, the, the message also says uh, these verses are not found in the earliest handwritten copies. I'm not sure why they add the word handwritten copies. It's not as though they had typewriters or or computers back in the <laughs> in the first, second, or third centuries A.D. Um, handwritten is a <laughs> very bizarre thing to say. Never mind the message is like that. I guess in the Living Bible it says verses nine to twenty are not found in the most ancient manuscripts, but may be considered an appendix giving additional facts, which is sort of almost sitting on the fence but saying the extra verses are a little bit extra but not not, not in the ancient manuscripts so it's kind of typical of the of, of the intent or or impression if not the exact words that's uh, included with some of the footnotes uh, footnotes or here or headings that are written in the uh, modern tr many of the modern translations. Again, I'd contend that these are misleading statements. Again, the phrase, the most ancient manuscripts. Um, most, if you read most ancient manuscripts, it almost seems like uh, most manuscripts are in that category, or most in the older, 
older manuscripts, but then it depends on what date range you're using. So again, it's highly misleading, these kinds of footnotes, when you look into the details of what's really going on. There are actually two very old manuscripts that do not have uh, the end of Mark 16. One is called Codex Sinaiticus. It's nothing to do with sinus, having sinus problems. Uh, it comes from Mount Sinai. Uh, it dates from the 4th century, probably around uh, uh, 350 AD. It's got both the Old and New Testaments, plus two epistles that are not considered uh, uh, canonical, the, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. The text is the Alexandrian text type. Mark ends at... Uh, at uh, verse 8 and also uh, worthy of note is that it excludes a passage from John chapter 7 verse 53 through to chapter 8 verse 11 which is a story about the woman caught in the act of adultery where Jesus writes on the ground and then says he who is without sin cast the first stone and that passage from John I think Hardly anyone ever questions its authenticity or worries about whether it belongs in there or not. They only worry about Mark chapter 16, John chapter 8, I completely um, ignore whether it's uh, valid or not. Codex Vaticanus, that's the second manuscript, uh, another 4th century, so that's... Uh, Around, this one is around 325 AD. So again, these are of the order of 300 years after go the Gospel of Mark was written. So they are old, but they're not by any means close to the original writing of the Gospel of Mark. And this is both the Old and the New Testaments, as the New Testament as far as Hebrews chapter 9 with the remaining pages being lost. Not surprising, of course, if you've got a manuscript, the bottom pages are going to be the ones that wear out the most. Uh, uh, Mark ends at verse 8, and again it omits that passage from John chapter 8. The interesting thing about Codex Vaticanus and it's a very, supposed to be a very neatly written uh, manuscript, but it leaves space at the end of Mark's Gospel. So instead of starting uh, Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, in the next column, uh, like the usual way it, uh, it does, the scribe left an entire column blank and started the Gospel of Luke on a fresh page. This is the only time in the New Testament section of Vaticanus that an entire column is left blank. It means that the scribe of Vaticanus was aware that more verses came after verse 8 and he purposely left space for them. And the space that's there is actually of a correct size and people have actually determined that yes it is big enough to fit the extra verses. So the scribe who stopped abruptly there uh, and left out those, the the ending, knew what he was doing, and knew that there were other verses, and and uh, deliberately stopped abruptly. Codex Sinaiticus, and when scholars came across a manuscript cases such as. St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai, the source of his manuscript, or St. Sebastian's Monastery outside Bethlehem, they're finding not uh, libraries, but storehouses of rejected text, sometimes kept in boxes or big shelves in libraries due to c space constraints. The texts were unacceptable because of their scribal errors and contain corrections. And that's exact a description of Codex Sinaiticus full of scribal errors, full of corrections, and in the category of uh, a rejected text. Uh, but someone picked it up and thought, this is interesting, this is old, 
it must be important because it's old, which is not necessarily true. Old is not necessarily more reliable. I'm old, does that make me more reliable? <coughs> the number of Greek manuscripts ending at verse 8 and the number uh, and the number having verses uh, 9 through to 20. So we're talking here only about Greek manuscripts. I'll add that qualifier. So the ones that have a full ending, well, they're over 1700, uh, 1600, sorry. Over 1600 manuscripts with a full ending. How many end with verse 8? Drum roll, please. You'll have to provide that to yourself. I don't have one. Three. Three manuscripts, including the two that we've looked at, end at verse 8. It's little wonder that the people who, uh, who, who favour textual criticism and, uh, and uh, favour the older manuscripts don't want to consider numbers because if they had to consider numbers they would have to uh, change their point of view quite dramatically. And when I see three that's slightly misleading because we've also got on top of that three the, the manuscripts that have, that have the uh, end of verse 8 and then have plus that shorter ending um, from the 7th century onward and, and we've got a few manuscripts that have got uh, um, the, f the the extra verses 9 through to 20 but actually include the note in the manuscript itself that some manuscripts don't have those verses so they, they were obviously working as an editor taking a, a number of uh, manuscripts comparing them and creating a new manuscript from them so th but there it is 3 verses 1600. It's hard to believe how much emphasis people believe people place on basically two or three manuscripts. I think the third one is uh, quite a bit older than uh, Sinaiticus Sin or uh, Vaticanus. But for many people, uh, they make the assumption that the old manuscripts are closer to original, pure form, free from later copying errors or deliberate changes. So that's an assumption. It's not a fact, it's an assumption, but it sort of grabbed a lot of people and, uh, and uh, uh, made them uh, uh, look, at these, uh, look at these two manuscripts and give them more weight and the 1600 manuscripts that came at a later date. It should be noted that conversely older may mean less used so it survived longer because it was not considered by, by the copyist as best. Obviously if you think you've got a good manuscript and a bad manuscript you, you use a good manuscript and you use it so much it wears out and you have to replace it quicker and so it's not around anymore and the dodgy manuscript you don't you don't use it all so it sits there wherever you placed it and it's safer. Older may also just be due to a technical reason that it came from a drier climate. This was the Alexandrian text type and it came from uh, Egypt which has got an extremely dry climate. Some, pa some parts of Egypt are described as having hyper-aridity. So manuscripts, uh, parchments, last for a very, very long time. Other parts, uh, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, where it's a lot wetter, a lot more rain, uh, parchment didn't survive very long and so it wore out quite quickly. Uh, and the fact that it uh, wore out quite quickly doesn't mean much apart from that it came from a different geographical region. Now points in favour of a majority text, by far the largest number of Greek manuscripts. 
they came from a region where Greek was the native language and the text was in continuous use. So they were using the manuscripts, they were reading from them day by day or week by week uh, from the time they were first produced in the first century AD continuously right up until uh, they uh, got uh, stored in their museums or wherever. Well, probably until 1453 where Constant, uh, Constantinople was overrun by the Turks and the scholars took their manuscripts to Europe where the Reformation uh, uh, scribe, scribes and experts took those and and uh, printed documents for the uh, uh, for the Greek manuscripts. This particular region that we're talking about um, before 1453 it was free for more than a thousand years safe from the ravages of wars and conquests much of a region uh, uh, had invading armies so many invading armies they had to put install traffic lights uh, for all the armies that were coming through it's also worth mentioning that this region was uh, where the uh, uh, where most of the epistles originate, uh, the uh, um, the uh, Corinthians, the uh, Thessalonians, the Ephesus, um, uh, Colossae, whatever else, they all came from from this region, where by far the largest man, they were all produced in this region. So it seems more logical to assume that the manuscripts originating from this region would would be the more reliable source particularly when you see that they were in continuous use and if they're in continuous use if anyone comes along and modifies them it would be pretty plain and obvious to all and sundry that are listening look they've changed especially since they speak the Greek An important point that many people have overlooked is that the Alexandrian text is not a text type that's missing the end of of, of Mark chapter 16 after verse 8. The Alexandrian text type doesn't stop at verse 8. It's only two or three of its manuscripts that stop at verse 8. And this is a thing that all the uh, people who talk about the subject completely uh, gloss over and there are about five or six small variations the variations are not very big but they are significant enough to say well this is distinctly Alexandrian and they're not just copying back into their text from from the Byzantine text type because the Byzantine text type doesn't have these uh, four five or six uh, uh, differences some of them are insignificant, They're, they don't affect the translation, some of them do, and they have small differences, in verse 18 it says, they shall take up serpents, and it inserts in their hands, which does change the context any much, it does sort of imply that the, this verse is to be taken literal rather than figuratively, which, which is a slight change doctrinally, Verse 19, it says, So then after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, the uh, majority text just says, After the Lord had spoken. Now, uh, I didn't really understand this, but I have read that when it says, The Lord, it's sort of implying the one and only Lord. Whereas when it's saying the Lord Jesus, it's trying to specify Jesus as one of many lords. So it's a sort of weaker designation um, but that's not really uh, here neither here nor there and then in verse 20 at the ending the majority text has the word Amen the, the Alexandrian text doesn't have the word Amen now just for the record the word Amen doesn't mean it's finished, it's all over, you can go home now, it's it's done with. Amen means so be it. 
So it's quite a reasonable thing to put at the end of the gospel, and it doesn't mean uh, the <laughs> what's happening isn't going to keep happening. Now, the important point here is the Alexandrian text type has this ending as well as the Byzantine text type has this ending. So whichever one is the older, uh, the, they, they had it and the ending was in existence before there was any kind of division into two text types or two streams of text. So in my, in my mind, this this does really speak to the fact that that the that this ending was indeed very very old, probably older than either the uh, the uh, Vaticanus or Sinaiticus uh, manuscripts. One other point that some people sometimes make is that uh, uh, verses nine to twenty aren't original because there's a completely different style or different way of writing and I don't fully understand the argument of, of this um, I will try and explain the two main points for this, uh, for this uh, uh, assertion the, uh, one of the things is that the passage includes ten words used nowhere else in Mark and the other point, there seems to be an abrupt shift between verse 8 and the remainder of the passage. Now, this continuing passage is clearly different from what's going on before because it's a change of scene. You watch a movie and the scene changes. You go from a dark scene inside a house to a, a scene outside. It's light, it's different. And so the conversation that's being portrayed in the Gospel is of course different. So this argument really doesn't seem to hold a lot of water. There are, different, there are ten words because ten different things are happening. So there are different words being used and a abrupt shift because things, different things are being said and different things are being referred to, just like happens throughout the Gospels. And if you use this kind of argument in many of the other uh, books of the New Testament, you may, <coughs> you may, <coughs> excuse me a moment. You may well come to the conclusion that that much of the of the New Testament, there are changes in emphasis, changes in writing style, changes in words used, and. What does it mean? Just that there are changes. It doesn't necessarily mean any more than that. Coming back to our authoritative expert, Bruce uh, Metzger, uh, he writes, These features indicate that the section was added by someone who knew of a form of mark that ended abruptly with verse 8 and who wished to supply a more appropriate conclusion. In view of the inconsinities, I don't know what that word means, looking up for homework, the inconsinities between verses 1 through to 8 and 9 through to 20, it's unlikely that the longer ending was composed ad hoc to fill up an obvious gap. So he's saying it's unlikely that this was just completely made up. That's his point of view. It wasn't just an ad hoc thing wasn't just like the shorter ending uh, th that we mentioned before um, it, it's then he goes on and says it's more likely that the section was exerted from another document dating perhaps from the first half of the second century so he's saying two things here it's unlikely to um, to be a made up thing but it may well be it may well have been inserted coming by uh, from another document from another writer uh, dating perhaps from the first half of the second century 
So again, he's reached the conclusion that these verses, although he believes they come from a from a different source, they can't. They were still very very early, more than a century before uh, these uh, two so-called reliable manuscripts uh, appeared. Now, you have to stand back and, and think for a minute. He's introduced a new document, possibly another, another gospel that we no longer have, and he's saying perhaps uh, this, this part of this gospel was, was taken in and uh, patched into the old one. Of course, this also means that early on um, Mark's Gospel was written and then they lost the last page or whatever. <coughs> so they're saying that they don't know what the original ending is and have tacked in something entirely different. So they lost the, the ending of Mark and then uh, they've lost the ending of Mark, but not only have they lost the ending of Mark, there are no copies around anywhere that have continued to be to include the real ending of Mark, because you know, sixteen hundred manuscripts, surely they would have included one of those with the with the real ending if it was a real ending that was different. But no, there's nothing. It's just a complete absence. And then, after that absence, a new verses are tacked in from a completely different document, and then people just accept that as Mark's gospel without question, without uh, without uh, much to do. M uh, many people just accept that as normal, and to me that sounds like a very convoluted explanation. Which need for a case that reads no convoluted explanation. Uh, often you hear the phrase Occam's razor. Uh, that's talking about a, a principle that people have. It's saying that the simplest explanation is often the best one, and they seem to have forgotten the op Occam's razor and grown a long beard. In this case, uh, the simplest explanation is that verses 9 to 20 are original <laughs> and that for some manuscripts they they just drop the verses the last page was missing and uh, they uh, they didn't know what it was about and that's how uh, the uh, they were missing from Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and from the manuscripts that tacked in the extra bit That isn't the whole story though. Now we come to the evidence from early Christian writers. And uh, here we see some very interesting things. We have this writer, Irenaeus, or however you pronounce his name. Apologies to the guy, I've, I've completely uh, muddled his name, how to pronounce his name. But he was a very early writer, a Christian theologian a minister who spent his adult life defending orthodoxy and fighting heresies, heresies like uh, uh, the Gnostics and all the other odd ends, odds and ends that people were coming up with in his book or, or document ag writing against heresies. He writes, also toward the conclusion of his gospel, Mark says, so then after the Lord Jesus had spoken to him, he was received up into heaven and sits on the right hand of God. A quote from Mark 16 verse 9. <coughs> and then he co continues confirming what had been spoken by the prophet. So not only is he uh, quoting a passage from these verses, not the entire passage, but a section from the passage, he's saying this is from the Gospel of Mark, not from some other Gospel not from some other source. This is from the Gospel of Mark. And he was a very early writer. 
not the first century but second century so uh, not very many generations removed from the people who actually wrote the Gospels but wait there's more then we get someone called Justin Martyr he lived about uh, 100 to 165 165 AD, one of the first and best apologists for the faith. Uh, that's someone who stands up for the faith, not someone who makes apology after apology and says, sorry, it's not that kind of apology. In his first apology, he uses words in Mark 16 verse 20 as a fulfillment of messianic prophecy in examination of Psalm 110. Again, using a verse from Mark, from from the end of Mark 16. Then we get Tatian the Syrian, 120 to 180 AD, a pupil of Justin Martyr, writer and theologian, in his Diatessaron, Harmony of the Gospels, incorporates material from all the four Gospels and includes Mark 16, 9 to 20. So he tries to combine all the four Gospels into one document and he include, includes these verses. Again, 2nd century AD, again long before these uh, two manuscripts that don't have the end of Mark 16. Then we come to Hippolytus, 170 to 235 AD. He's a contemporary of Irenaeus, although probably overlapping at the end of his uh, lifetime. He was a bishop of Portus near Rome from 190 to 227 AD. In his writings, in one of the fragments, he quote Mark 16 uh, verses 17 and 18 uh, and when speaking of Christ he has reference to verse 19. And also writers in the 200s who uh, used the longer ending of Mark Polyphor, Polyphor, Ferry, uh, 324 to 234 to 305 did, and in uh, a book by on rebaptism by an unknown author, included the longer ending. In the 300s earlier, in the calendar of Greek of Greek church lessons, they used Mark 16 9 to 20 as the verses to be read on Ascension Day and on St. Mary Magdalene's Day. So this was a part of the Greek church from very early on. And we just keep going. Vincentius died 304 AD, again before those two uh, manuscripts, Bishop of the Thibori, look up for, uh, for homework where that is, at the Seventh Council of Carthage, held in the Cyprian in 256, in the presence of 87 assembled African bishops, quoted Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, and that was recorded in the, in the minutes of the Council. Ambrose, 374 to 397 AD, Archbishop of Milan, quoted from the long ending of Mark's Gospel in, in the late 300s. Ambrose cites verse 15 some four times, verses 16, 17 and 18 three times each, and verse 20 once. So he definitely accepted those verses as being uh, true and authentic. Then we get to, to Rome. I'm not sure why a picture of Jerome includes him with a bare shoulder, but uh, we'll leave that for the for the moment. Jerome, 331 to 420 AD. He was one of the uh, uh, really important characters of the time. At the request of the Pope, uh, he uh, he uh, he produced the official Catholic version of the Bible called the Latin Vulgate. And this was the, uh, uh, the this was the important single most important Latin translation of the Bible 
for many, many centuries, as particularly as far as the Catholic Church was concerned. In fact, by the time of the Reformation, the uh, uh, the Catholic Church was so uh, invested in this Latin translation that they didn't even want to look at the old uh, uh, Greek manuscripts to come up with new modern translations or more modern by that time. Jerome consulted several manuscripts, including many old ones, uh, presumably ones that he had that we know we no long, longer have, all of which contained a long, long ending. He was aware of that some manuscripts didn't have the long ending, but chose to include it in his authoritative Latin Bible. So he was aware that there was a controversy or was a lingering possibility of doubt, or but he came to the conclusion that it should be added. So we come to the only sensible conclusion that the, uh, the longer ending of Mark is almost certainly authentic. There's very little reason to believe it's not, that much of the uh, discussion, much of the argument against it is quite uh, misleading, um, omits many important details, uh, like the huge number of contrary manuscripts, like the uh, Alexandrian text that actually has it, like the early writers that include it. Obviously these are very very complicated things to try and explain to a, to an average person in a, in a simple discussion. Um, it takes a long time to go through all of this and uh, unless you're really concerned um, how do you explain this in a simple man manner and it's not easy. But, uh, but the simple fact is that those who are opposed to healings, to miracles and to the baptism of the Holy Spirit People who you might call cessationists do not support this longer ending. That's why they oppose this. And probably why they don't care about the passengers in John about the woman caught in the act of adultery. And they have absolutely no uh, websites or, or, or long discussions about that at all. Um, you might also say and if that's the case today, that they don't want these verses because they're too confronting, and they really are confronting. It's simple logic. If uh, the logical argument is A implies B, then not B implies not A. And we've got here a case of these signs will follow those that believe. So if you believe, then that, that implies that these signs will follow. So if you don't believe, so no signs, that implies not a believer. Sorry, that's just the, the way the cookie crumbles. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's logic and it's very confronting, but that's how important these verses are. But if it's, uh, if it's opposed today, it may have been also opposed in about 300 AD, because by that time uh, the, uh, the signs and wonders had started to disappear, so it's quite possible that people had started to say, please drop those verses from the manuscript. But of course, the scribe for Vaticanus left a space, maybe that was his way of saying, yes, I've dropped it, I've done what I was told, but I know that those verses exist. That's, that's speculation, of course. So this is the end of the, what you might call the serious discussion and uh, the uh, important things to consider. As I say, it's rather difficult to uh, explain this to the person in the street. Maybe just say 1,600 manuscripts have a longer ending and only three end at verse 8. And uh, we do need to come across and mention one more, one more thing. 
sometimes poo, people do talk about Ivan Panin and his uh, numerics. And they say, what about Ivan Panin's numerics? And Ivan Panin studied the Greek of the New Testament and claimed that there were numerical patterns there that could only, uh, that couldn't have happened by chance and prove that the Bible uh, was divinely inspired. Now, I don't know the full story about this. I've looked into detail in Mark chapter 16. I can't say that my results that, that I'm going to explain from Mark chapter 16 also apply to the rest of, of the Greek New Testament, and they definitely don't apply to the uh, any possible numerical patterns in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. But with those qualifications, let's go to Mark 16. Appendence claim number of words in the text for these 12 verses 175, which is 7 times 25. Words spoken by Jesus 65 or 7 times 8. Number of Greek forms 133, 7 times 19. Number of vocabulary words 98, which is 7 times 7 times 2. Number of letters in the vocabulary words, uh, 553 equals 7 times 79. And he continues in great detail and looks at uh, many, many features of this passage and says, look at all these features with the number 7 in appearing in them. And he says, this couldn't have happened by chance. This is proof that the verses are original. He also says that this is correct if that these patterns appear without the Amen. Uh, but if you put the Amen in, uh, the, ver the patterns all disappear. Unfortunately, when I look into this, none of this is true. The number of words is 165. That's in the majority text, also in the received text the text used for the uh, King James Bible for the, I'll use RT as an abbreviation for that uh, received text and majority text are essentially the same for this passage now there are much more modern compilations of the Greek that uh, these rely to a greater extent on the Alexandrian text type and uh, and that's how I know that the Alexandrian text type does include Mark chapter 16 and the longer ending. But, and uh, one of the most uh, authoritative compilations is that of Nestle Lalonde. Sorry, I've, mi I've mispronounced your name. I don't mean to butcher your names. Um, but it was, they came up with 170 words in this passage neither which are divisible by seven and different from what Ivan Panin said and even the uh, compilation Westcott and Hort that, that Panin claims that he used had 172 words not 175 and you dig into it and uh, Panin actually had to split up words to make it come to 173, so he's actually tinkering with it and adjusting things to make it fit. But let's continue. Words spoken by Jesus, 56, no. Words spoken by Jesus, 52 in the majority text, or 55 in Nessalaland. Number of Greek forms, 130 in the received text, or 131 in Nessalaland neither of which are divisible by, by 7. In fact, the first one's divisible by 13, and the second one is prime. Number of vocabulary words is 98. Not sure how he concluded that. He included a word in his vocabulary that's not even in the text, at least not in the text, uh, with received text or in the Nessalon text. So how he came up with that, I don't know. So he should have said 97, which is not divisible by 7. It's a prime number. Incidentally, the majority text has 99 words in it, not 98. 
number of letters in the vocabulary words. Uh, 553, according to Pannon. No, 561 or 558, neither of which are divisible by 7. So we can say with a fair degree of accuracy that this pattern does not, that is not present in uh, Mark chapter 16. That doesn't mean that Mark chapter 16, the longer ending, isn't divinely inspired. It almost certainly is part of a genuine part of Mark chapter 16. It's just Ivan Pannon doing some dodgy things, and you please don't use it as as an excuse uh, or as a simple means of trying to validate Mark chapter 16. Sorry, you were stuck with the hard work of explaining why it's valid. Maybe the simplest explanation for saying why it's valid is that it comes to pass. You can put it to the test and see that God does confirm the word with the signs following. And we don't need fictional uh, constructs contrived by Ivan Pannon to prove these things. So we'll end that there. Um, hope this wasn't too long. And uh, sorry if uh, some degree of disappointment about Ivan Pannon. Um, we're concerned about the truth and we have a love for the truth and that's really all that matters.